الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين. Um, thank you guys for joining me. Uh, it's Friday night. Uh, hopefully this is not an uh, inconvenience to anybody. Uh, but after, much like many of you, after watching the um, the biography, I mean the documentary on uh, Malcolm X, who killed Malcolm X, uh, I think it was, you know, inevitable as well as uh, imperative that we have a discussion. Um, <clears throat> I took a look on YouTube. I see, you know, some people have been having discussions about this documentary, um, but none has had this discussion from an Islamic standpoint, from a Sunni Muslim standpoint. All right, um, and I'm I'm sure that you know there are a lot of Sunni Muslims that have you know some questions, some gripes. Uh, some issues with some of the things that we saw, some of the things that we heard uh, on this documentary. So for the little bit of time that I, I have with you guys, um, I want to unpack some of this stuff. Man. Uh, I mean, some of the stuff that I saw and heard is just like you, you just can't you can't ignore, you know, what you saw and what you heard. It, it, it was really unfortunate that, not unfortunate, the unfortunate part is what we were all introduced to or what we were all reminded of, of the murder of, you know, the assassination of Al-Hajj Malik Al-Shabazz, better known as Malcolm X. You know, um, the unfortunate thing is what we were reminded of. Um, the good thing that came out of that documentary is the information that we are now privy to that many of us may, uh, may or may not have been privy to before. Uh, I know for me, I, I thought I knew everything there was to know about the assassination, the murder of Malcolm X. I, I really did. I thought I knew everything until I saw this documentary. All right. Um, <clears throat> So I want to, you know, take some time out to unpack some of the stuff that we saw and some of the stuff that we heard um, from a Sunni Muslim perspective, all right, um, or Orthodox Muslim, whatever term you want to use. Um, I, I've seen a lot of non-Muslims, you know, give their take on it, um, but I have yet to see, you know, any take on it from, you know, an Orthodox traditionalist, you know, Sunni Muslim. So let me start by saying, uh, and as we go through this, um, as we go through this, uh, we're going to see the stages of truth throughout, you know, this documentary. You know, they say that truth goes through three stages. Number one is ridicule, that the person is going to be ridiculed for whatever it is they're saying. And that is because as a leader, they oftentimes see things that the average person cannot see, all right? And so therefore, they take a stance or they take a position on something that is not popular, not going to be well received. And as a result of that, they are usually crucified for it. They are usually the first to draw people's attention to something that people may or may not have seen, however, just probably didn't have the gall, didn't have the, you know, articulation to express what they were seeing. Malcolm, on the other hand, he was one of those people who kind of saw something, something wasn't right with the movement known as the Nation of Islam. Um, some of how, uh, some of the ways in which people within that movement, how they were moving, you know, he felt the jealousy, the envy. He felt it, even though the average person may not have been able to see it, you know, and it reached a point where he could just no longer be silent about it, you know. Um, and I mean, as one of the guys on the documentary mentioned, 
that the relationship between Elijah Muhammad and Malcolm X was like a father and son relationship, but they had to realize that there was not going to be a happy ending to that relationship. I mean, when you look at Malcolm's demeanor, you look at his personality, he's not the type of person that's going to turn a blind eye to, you know, what's going on. He, he's not that person. So, you know, I, I'm guessing that some people, you know, within Elijah's camp, within his family, as we know that some of his, you know, Elijah Jr., we know that, you know, some of the people within his own family, you know, you know, had some, you know, had some real issues, you know, and saw Malcolm to be a threat it, in the event that something was to happen to Elijah Muhammad. They knew he was going to be a threat, right? Waalaikum salam, brother Gadid, hayakallah. Like, they, they knew he was going to be a threat. They knew he was going to be an issue. So it was just a matter of time, all right? They say that truth goes through three stages. The first is ridicule, that the person is going to be ridiculed. And even if you look at the life of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we can see his own truth go through these very three stages. The first is ridicule. What did they say about Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? They called him Majnoon. They called him crazy. They called him Sahir. They called him a magician. They called him uh, Kathab. Kathab on Ashir. They called him a liar. They called him a fortune teller. They called him all types of names, trying to discredit him. And I'm going to come back to that point. All right. Trying to discredit him. All right. And then the second stage that truth goes through is violent opposition. They're going to oppose you. Right. If you can't shut the person up, you shut them down. So we're going to violently oppose you. We're going to do something to you physically. And of course, they put a bounty on the head of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam just as um, they put a hit out on Malcolm X, right? They say that he should either be, you know, crippled, you know, or what was the other word they used, right? Killed or crippled, you know? So he knew that there was a hit out on him, all right? And people keep saying, well, the Nation of Islam didn't have anything to do with that. That's the greatest lie ever told next to the devil doesn't exist. That is the greatest lie ever told next to the devil doesn't exist. That the Nation of Islam had nothing to do with the murder of Malcolm X. Are you serious? This guy, Nori Muhammad, he goes to the breakfast club and he sits there and says that the Nation of Islam had nothing to do with the murder of Malcolm X. Were you not watching the documentary? Did you not hear the comments that were made about him? You, you have got to be kidding me. How are you still trying to spin this story decades later rather than just standing in your truth and just saying what it is? You, you got to be kidding me, man. You had nothing to do with the murder. Oh, Elijah Muhammad said, don't lay a hand on Malcolm X. I mean, the type, the level of corruption that went on within the nation of Islam, and you sit sitting here telling me that they had that level of adherence to Elijah Muhammad's command. And then, of course, we could see on the documentary, the comments that were made, the little innuendos that were made, that any person could have taken that as a green light to go ahead and you know, assassinate Malcolm X. You know? Come on, man. Like, you had nothing to do with it? Nothing? You didn't call him a hypocrite? Which, in, in Sunni Islam, we know that when a person goes that far, that means that pretty much your blood is halal. Your blood is halal. You're, you're up for grabs, and anybody who wants to take it upon themselves to do... And then, of course, obviously, yani at the barra minhum. You know what I mean? We're going to distance ourselves. We're going to free ourselves and say we had nothing to do with it. But, you know, come on, man. To sit here and say, like, you had nothing to do with that? Like, come on, man. Anyway, um, you're going to be ridiculed. Uh, you're going to be violently opposed. And then the last one is that uh, people accept your truth uh, as evident truth. It becomes evident truth. Everybody can now see that it's true. But it has to go through those three stages. Keep that in mind as we move forward. Every single truth goes through these particular stages. 
at first you're going to be ridiculed. People are going to call you crazy. And that's the, the quickest way to dismiss. And that means that when we call you crazy or call you a hypocrite, you know, even in the Sunni community, even in the Salafi community, you know, we'll call you, you know, we'll make tech fear on you. You know, you're a hypocrite or you're a Kafir or you're a concert person of innovation, right? Muptadir. And when people put those labels on you, what does that do? That removes the sensitivity that people have for you. So when a person labels you, and let's use the modern vernacular in the Sunni Muslim community, when a group of scholars or a scholar or a group of misfits from amongst the Muslims, you know, who call themselves Salafis, right? And they label you a, a person of innovation. Sahib Bida. You're a person of innovation. What that does is it removes the level of sensitivity that people have for you. So now people can, like, it's like your honor is basically up for grabs. And nobody feels anything for you. The, the lay person, the, you know, a lemon from amongst the laymen, you know, will be able to talk about you like a dog with, with no respect for your honor, simply because they have already begun, uh, uh, you know, this attack on your character, assassinating your character. And we're going to get deeper into that because there's so many parallels between what happened during that time, Right as to what is happening even now in our Muslim community, showing you that we really haven't learned from previous mistakes. They say that if words don't add up, it's probably because the truth was not included in the equation. They say that if words don't add up, it's probably because the truth is not included in the, uh, in, uh, in the equation. You know, when I watched, you know, in somewhat of awe and shock at the whole six, you know, six episodes of that docuseries, I couldn't help but, you know, notice the same trends, the same behaviors, the same behaviors, the same themes resounding, replaying themselves over and over and over again in our current climate of this detachment from the Quran and the Sunnah. I'm, when you watch the docuseries, pay attention. You can, if you are a Muslim who is, you know what I mean? If you are a Muslim who is concerned, you can see while you're watching that docuseries, you can see the same themes, you know, resounding, you know, replaying themselves over and over and over again right now in the Muslim community. One of these themes, I'm going to mention a few of them. I want you to stay with me, please. I lose some of you guys, and then it's just easy to say, oh, he's talking off his rocker, he's astray anyway, simply because you can't follow. Stop throwing people away. Stop trashing people. Stop labeling people, you know, just because you can't follow along. Simply because you don't have the mental capacity or the educational capacity to follow along. The references, the the innuendos, the the... Like you can't follow. <laughs> you can't follow along. And believe it or not, you have many people who throw around the word, oh, he's astray or he's off it or he's this, he's that. Not because he's off it or he's really astray. It's just that you can't really follow them. You can't really follow. So when people say, oh, I don't take from him, I'm glad you don't take from me. I I'm glad you don't because you would get lost. <laughs> 30 minutes of listening to me will have your head spinning, not because I'm intelligent or I'm smart or I'm some type of intellect, right? Or some type of intellectual. No, but because you don't have the comprehension level to keep up. You don't. And, and many people just need to own that. You don't have the comprehension level to keep up. You're not well read. So therefore, when references are made to, you know, books or to individuals, like your bubble is so small you know what I mean? Like you take from one scholar. <laughs> How small is your bubble? Meanwhile, you have the scholars of the Salaf that would take from all of the scholars in their vicinity before they would travel for knowledge beyond their vicinity, beyond their village, beyond their country. 
Meanwhile, he's talking about today, or oh, I only take from this scholar. I only, I only listen to this sheikh or that sheikh. It's like, you got it backwards, man. You've been miseducated here again. Miseducated, right? <clears throat> so one of the themes that we see constantly replaying in the docuseries is the constant claim of people of being on truth and being lovers of truth, right? Being lovers of truth. You see that, like, you know, this was something that the nation prided themselves on. We are people of truth and justice. You know, we're people that love the truth and, you know, and even some of the Sunni Muslims, and I'm gonna come to that, even some of the Sunni Muslims that were on the documentary who are, you know, professors of, you know, people of truth. We see that over and over. And even in today's time, you know, I want to be on the hawk and I'm on the hawk and I'm on the truth. You know, we claim and we profess to be people of truth. However, when somebody holds a mirror up to us, when someone holds a mirror up to us, we either assassinate their character or we assassinate them personally. We, we take offense to it simply because we don't, as African-Americans, this conversation is for African-Americans. I cannot speak for any other culture. I'm talking about black Muslims, African-American Muslims. African-American Muslims. We are, we have an intolerance for discomfort. We don't like to be discomforted. We don't like to be put in situations where people hold a mirror up to us and make it makes us uncomfortable. And what we'll end up doing is we'll end up killing the person physically, harming them, or we'll either assassinate their character. We'll assassinate their character. And this is reminiscent the behavior of another group of people who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addresses in the Quran as Bani Israel. As I look at our behavior as African Americans, you know, you have like, you know, the, the black Jews that are always talking about the black people are the original Jews. It really got me shaking my head, to be honest with you, because I'm looking at the behavior of Bani Israel in the Quran. And then you look at the behavior of African Americans, man, like, wallahi, the parallels are just so finite. They're just so close. It's ridiculous, man. And I'm not saying that we're the black Jews. I, I mean, I don't really care one way or another. It doesn't, it doesn't make me, you know, it doesn't make me or break me. It doesn't really matter to me. But what I'm saying is to say is that the behaviors are so close. So close. And it's not a coincidence. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, listen to how Allah described Bani Israel. Right here again, we're talking about people who profess to be lovers of truth and be people of truth. But when someone holds a mirror up to us, we either want to assassinate you, we want to hurt you physically, or we want to assassinate your character because God forbid we have to stand in the discomfort of the truth about ourselves. God forbid we have to sit in the discomfort of the truth about ourselves. That is something that we are not willing to do. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to Bani Israel, أَفَكُلَّمَا جَاءَكُمْ رَسُولٌ بِمَا لَا تَهْوَىٰ أَنفُسُكُمْ إِسْتَكْبَرْتُمْ فَفَرِيقًا كَذَّبْتُمْ وَفَرِيقًا تَقْتُلُونَ Listen to what Allah says. Is it the case, Allah is addressing Bani Israel, is it the case that every time a messenger comes to you, is it the case that every time a messenger comes to you, with, with something that you do not desire, every time a messenger comes to you with something that you don't desire, you become arrogant. And as I talked about arrogance in the khutbah today, arrogance is looking down on people and rejecting the truth when it comes to you. Rejecting the truth when it comes to you. Is it the case that every time a messenger comes to you with something that you dislike, you become arrogant? You reject it. A group of the messengers you belie, you deny, you assassinate their character. 
وَفَرِيقًا تَقْتُلُونَ And another group of the prophets and messengers, you kill. You do one or two things. You either assassinate their character or you assassinate their person. That's us in a nutshell. Time and time again, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala proves to us that this claim of being people of truth and being on the truth is just an abstract claim with no real reality behind it. It's just something that we say. It's just something that we say. It, but did you see the ayah? Allah said, Fariqan kadabatu wa fariqan taqtulun. A group, you belie, you deny, you assassinate their character, you call them liars, you deny them. Wa fariqan taqtulun. And another group, you kill. Right? Bani Israel, they killed uh, Prophet Zechariah, they killed Prophet Yahya, they tried to kill Prophet Jesus. You understand? That, that's, that's their MO. That's their modus operandi. You kill your prophets. And, and African Americans, we do the same thing. Pay attention. So it appears that, you know, our culture, that, that's one thing that I noticed, that we constantly say we're on the truth, we love the truth, but then when someone holds the truth about us, up to us, we can't handle it. We don't like being discomforted. We don't like people telling us the truth about ourselves. And when you do that, you run the risk of angering somebody to the point where they're going to either shut you up or shut you down. One of the two. They're going to either shut you up or shut you down. Even if J. Edgar Hoover did not pull the trigger and give the order for the hit on Malcolm, even if the, the feds did not have anything to do with that, which we know they did, but even if they didn't, the nation of Islam was going to kill him anyway. They were going to kill him anyway. He has said too much. And then you have this guy, Nori Muhammad, goes on the breakfast club and says, well, y'all don't even know. Malcolm was trying to come back to the nation. you got to be kidding me, man. Another lie. Malcolm was trying to come back to the nation? Malcolm said, I had been freed and I'm willing to work with everybody or work against everybody. <laughs> that man was not trying to go back to the nation of Islam. Are you kidding me? Nor would the nation of Islam welcome him back after the things that he said about Elijah Muhammad. Come on, man. Who, who are you fooling? Malcolm was going to link with other civil rights leaders like you know, like Martin Luther King, and that's what got him killed. That is what got him killed. God forbid two powerful black men link up, put their differences aside, link up and begin doing some work. God forbid that happen. Talking about, y'all don't even know, he was trying to come back to the nation of Islam. You gotta be kidding me, man. Who, who, whose eyes are you trying to pull wool over? You gotta be kidding me, man. I'm sitting here looking, listening to the interview like, you I can't make this stuff up, man. Another spin. Another spin that you put on the story. Another theme that I noticed throughout the documentary is as African Americans, we have a culture where the lie is more palatable, even within our own dysfunctional families, the lie is more palatable for us than the truth. The lie is more palatable than the truth. We live with the lie. We live with the lie at the expense of our own well-being, our own healthiness, our own mental well-being. We live with the lie. How many lies in, in, in our families as African Americans are we living with right now, right? We live with the lie. The African American Muslim community in North New Jersey has been living with this lie for decades that the Nation of Islam had nothing to do with the murder of Malcolm X. Yet, the one appalling thing that we saw in that documentary was that every single person the brother Abdurrahman went to automatically knew that this certain individual was the gunman, the shotgun man, the guy who was responsible for killing Malcolm X. 
It was almost like it was common knowledge. It was almost like it was common knowledge. And I'm from that area. So for me, it's like, you have got to be kidding me. Some of the people that were on the documentary, I know personally, I've prayed next to, I've worked alongside of. And I'm sitting here like shaking my head like, you got to be kidding me. Y'all knew this whole time? It was common knowledge to everybody? And I'm just like mind blown. I mean, our old heads, man, subhanAllah, man, let us down, man. Our old heads, man, this is, this was the, you know, this was the, the, the truth that y'all chose to omit. The next, our generation, man, like we couldn't even have closure. I mean, we didn't even know that Malcolm was actually that connected to us. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like I read about Malcolm X in prison, I converted to Islam after reading his autobiography almost three times. <laughs> Never knew that people from not necessarily my city, but in my my territory, my, you know, my parts, you know, what I mean, like was responsible for, you know, taking this man off of this earth, man. Crazy. And then walking around Nork like it was. You know, then went back to jail for some other crimes. Like, it's not like you murdered Malcolm, you felt bad about it, you made Toba, you realized you were wrong, and you changed your life, man. You went back to a life of crime right after you did that. <laughs> you went back to a life of crime after that was done. And it was like it was common knowledge that everybody, all the old heads in the, in the city of North knew you know, the real story, the real story for years. We're being told that it was the FBI, CIA, you know, some people, the nation of Islam, but the nation of Islam steady saying, no, we had nothing to do with it. And it's just like this whole time, it was like, it was common knowledge. Yeah, we know. And then everybody you go to is just like, yeah, but we don't talk about that. We, we tuck that under the rug. We sweep that under the prayer rug, mashallah, to Allah. Yeah, I mean, you know, so we like to live with the lie, you know, and even pass the lie down on to our children, man. Like, I, I know, I know, I, I hung out with people. I hung out with people who I remember it was this girl in our neighborhood. She got pregnant. And she was messing with two dudes. She was messing with two dudes. And she got pregnant. And she didn't even know who the kid's father was, man. And she just said it was yours. It's yours. And, you know, the lie that they fed the kid. You know what I mean? Like, you're telling this kid his entire life that this guy is his father. Meanwhile, you as the mother, you don't even really know who the hell the father is. Here again, we'll live with the lie for years rather than sitting down and say, hey, you know, I was a teenager when I had you, you know, and I'm, I'm not going to lie to you. I'm going to be completely transparent with you. I really don't know who your father is. But we'll live with the lie. We'll live with the lie. That's part of our culture to live with the lie. You know, a girl is molested in the family by her uncle, by her cousin, molested, touched in the wrong way, in the most inappropriate way, by an adult in the family. And then the mother finds out about it. And what do we do? We bury it. We bury that truth. We bury that truth. Don't say nothing to nobody. Don't tell nobody. We're going to live with this lie all the way out. Meanwhile, the same uncle shows up at family gatherings and the little niece or the little girl that was molested, that was raped by this guy, she got to sit there at the table with, with this guy, knowing what this guy has done, but to spare the family. We're going to live with the lie. We're going to bury the truth. We're going to live with the lie. That's what goes on in, in many black families. Goes on in other families as well, but I'm not talking about other families. I'm talking about our stuff right here. I'm 
I am Malcolm X today. I'm holding up the mirror today. And it's, it's sad, man. This, this girl got to sit at the table and watch this uncle come in the kitchen who molested her in the bathroom, in the bedroom somewhere, and watch him come in the kitchen and get a plate and say nothing. Sit there with that trauma all to not destroy the family, right? We live with the lie. We bury the truth and we live with the lie. And the thing about it is that they say when you sweep something under the rug long enough, you'll eventually end up tripping on what has piled up underneath it. If you sweep something under the rug long enough, you'll end up tripping on what has piled up underneath it. Meaning the skeletons in the closet eventually come back to haunt us all. And we are probably not even aware that in the African-American Muslim community, especially in the Newark area, especially in the Newark area, the African-American Muslim community, a dark cloud looms over those communities simply because there was a huge injustice that was done to a man and there was never any closure brought to that situation. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, I mean, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala says in the Quran, pay attention to this. Pay attention to this ayah. Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala says, What taqu fitnatin la tusibanna alladheena zalamu minkum khassa. And fear a fitna. Fear a trial or tribulation that may not only affect the wrongdoers from amongst you. Meaning a group of people can do something wrong, a huge injustice. And because that situation was not rectified, the consequences of that injustice not only affects the perpetrators who are responsible for it, but can also affect their family members. This is what we call a generational curse. Real. That's a fact. You think that you can do an injustice to people and you think that that consequences of that injustice is not going to come back to you. It may come back to you. It's for sure going to come back to you, but it may also come back to your children may come back to your grandchildren. It may come back to a whole community of people because of an injustice that one individual did that everybody knew about and nobody did a damn thing about it. Nobody did a damn thing about it. And I'm not saying that it should have he should have been retaliated against. I'm not advocating violence. But hell, you know, we didn't have to send him off, you know, to his maker with, you know, this grandiose janaza. And I'm, I'm looking at like, damn, like they gave him a janaza. They gave him a better janaza than Malcolm X had. I, I'm, I'm just, I'm just appalled. I'm just appalled. I'm not saying you had to retaliate, but what I am saying is that. You know, didn't the Prophet Sallallahu refuse to pray over certain people? <laughs> I'm sure there's some people in the North area right now that if I die today and my janazah was held in East Orange somewhere, that there's some people who ain't coming to my janazah because I'm still a deviant in their eyes. I'm still a deviant in their eyes. But you, you, you know, you have a guy amongst you who was responsible for murdering one of the most influential African-American Muslims of our time. And everybody shows up at the janazah like, you know, this guy was a saint. And, and I'm going to come to the comment that Amin made about, you know, him making Hajj and making Toba. And you know, I'm not here to judge anybody, but when you make an incorrect statement about Islam, those who know it becomes their responsibility to correct that. It becomes 
their responsibility. Like, I mean, but think about that generational curse. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, in fear of fitna that will not only affect the wrongdoers from amongst you. And then you look at the track record of Islam in that area amongst African Americans it has been nothing but strife, has been nothing but trial, tribulating, in-house fighting, in-house separation, fragmenting. Every time a community opens, a group breaks off, opens up another community, breaks off, splintering, 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 till now you look at the children of many of those who, you know, were the pioneers of Sunni Islam in those areas, man. Where are their children? Where are the Hufar, the Quran? Where are those that are going to, you know, protect the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Where? Where? What happened? And it's possible that this fitna that Allah is talking about in this ayah, it's possible that we didn't, ex we didn't escape that. We didn't escape that. Because there was an injustice that was done and it was never corrected. Don't you know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Inni haramtu dhulm ala nafsi wa ja'altuhu baynakum muharrama fala tudhalamu. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the hadith of Qudsi that indeed I have made dhulm, I have made injustice haram upon me. Meaning Allah himself, God himself will not oppress anybody. As Allah says in the Quran, and your Lord will not do any injustice to anybody. That I have made dhulm, I have made oppression and injustice Something that is forbidden for me, and I have made it forbidden for you all. So don't do injustice to one another. Don't oppress one another. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hates injustice. Because injustice, let me, let me tell you one of the reasons why God hates injustice. Because when you do an injustice to someone, it may possibly lead to them denying the existence of God. It will possibly lead to them disbelieving in God. Think about how many people we know an injustice was done to in the Muslim community and they left Islam. Right? Think about how many people we know in the Muslim community an injustice was done to them whether it was a woman in a marriage who some injustice was done to her. And as a result of that injustice, she goes to the message trying to get, you know, the matter dealt with. She, she's told on one occasion, oh, you didn't get married here, so we can't help you. She's told on another occasion, oh, you know, just fear Allah and be patient. She's told on another, and I mean, all of these things, la yusminu wa la yukhni min jur, they do not satisfy, satiate. They don't satisfy the situation. So the, the injustice remains. And what ends up happening to the woman? She ends up leaving Islam. Because the injustice wasn't rectified. Nobody was thinking about Malcolm's children. <laughs> I mean, like, what happens to his children now? Do you really think they want to be associated or affiliated with a religion where if you say the wrong thing, one of your own brothers is going to murder you? Or, you know, you could be infiltrated. This whole brotherhood of Islam, the nation of Islam's brotherhood, couldn't have possibly been that strong. The FBI had informants all over and all throughout the nation of Islam. Don't talk to me about brotherhood. That's bull crap. Don't talk to me about brotherhood. What brotherhood? When you will pull a pistol out and blow the brains out of another brother. Right, because the FBI got you, you know, cornered. You, you don't want to go back to jail. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, come on, man. Then you talk about brotherhood. What brotherhood? I mean, it goes on in the Sunni Muslim community as well. They come to the masjid recording your khutbahs or whatever, and then we salamu alaykum, brother, and then, you know, we're all supposed to be one brotherhood. Like, come on, man, let's leave with that. Every brother ain't your brother. 
And that's a fact. <laughs> you can miss me with all of that stuff, man. But the point that I'm making is that that injustice was never rectified. That, ju that injustice was never rectified. And injustice is something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala abhors. He hates. And not only was the injustice never rectified, we walked around and ignored it like it was nothing. That man walking around North New Jersey was a rep what he represented in essence was a huge injustice that he did to somebody else. And everybody around him knew it and nobody said anything. Meanwhile, we shouting from the rooftops about how much hawk we on, how much truth we on, how many how much lovers of truth we are. And it's all a farce, man. So it is possible that this injustice, you know, set off or created a cycle of social dysfunction in an environment, right? And has crippled many Islamic, African-American Islamic communities uh, all the way up until today. There was no closure with that situation from the people who knew exactly what happened. There were those of us who were just completely ignorant, completely ignorant. We didn't know anything. But then there were those on the inside who really knew what happened. And, and you live with that, live with the lie. Let me explain something to you. Murder in Islam. I don't know what murder in the nation of Islam stands for. You know, I don't know how they handle murder in the nation of Islam, because let's be clear about something. The nation of Islam is in no way, shape, form, or fashion affiliated with the traditional teachings of Islam. The Islam that was given to the last prophet and messenger Muhammad ibn Abdullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I hold that to be my truth. That is my truth. I am not here to argue and debate with anybody. You are free in this day and time to believe whatever the heck you want to believe. It is my belief that the nation of Islam, founded by Farad Muhammad, passed on to his messenger, who was supposedly the messenger to the black man, Elijah Muhammad, Elijah Poole, that version, I can't even say version of Islam, because it's not Islam, in no way, shape, form, or fashion. Anytime you build uh, the foundation of your religion is based upon a law coming down in the form of, ironically, a guy who looks white. Here you are promoting that the white man is the devil or the white man is this and that. And yet you work hand in hand with the white man. <laughs> you work hand in hand. It's a, com it's a complete farce. Everything you were told is, it, you know what I mean? Like, come on, man. You work hand in hand with the FBI. James, uh, 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 John Ali, the head secretary, the, the man next to Elijah Muhammad was working with the FBI, <laughs> was working with the feds. Hey, come on, man. And I mean, when you look at Nation of Islam, N-O-I, it's possibly if you break that down as they like to break down words Allah, uh, you know the A stands for this, they like to break down words and play semantics N-O-I could possibly stand for no Islam how about that do you guys ever think about that that movement became the biggest distraction for African Americans from traditional Sunni Islam no, N-O-I, no, N-O-I, no Islam. How about that? Because we're going to make sure that African Americans never, never get the truth. And all the way up until right now, we're still sifting through from Saudi scholars and ulama and scholars from overseas. And I'm not saying that some of these scholars are not legitimate scholars. I'm not taking that away. But those who infused you know their stuff into our culture 
to fragment and separate. Many of us are fragmented and separated from one another right now, never even met each other. But based upon what some scholar in Saudi Arabia said, stay away from this guy. Don't listen to this guy. This is a this is this is what has happened. Still not having our hands on real Islam. Still all the way up into this very moment. Still miseducated. Still miseducated to this very moment. Some of you are probably only listening to me right now, waiting for me to make a mistake so you can run back and, you know, your cognitive bias. <laughs> You're not listening to me because you really want to hear truth. You're just listening for the mistake <laughs> because of what some Saudi scholar told you or what some brother some jealous, envious, behind brother told you. <laughs> Here again, you'll never get your hands on real Islam. N-O-I, no, the I, Islam, no Islam. I mean, you, the foundation of their religion is that Master Allah came down in the form of Master Farah Muhammad. The same guy who had over 26 aliases Nobody even knows where he came from. Give me the origin of this guy. Who were his parents? <laughs> they can't give you any of that. That's the origin. Meanwhile, the origin of traditional Islam is la ilaha illallah. There's no deity worthy of worship except Allah. And Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is his messenger. And then you have people, I got into arguments with people in North. Talking about, oh, you know, you wouldn't be wearing a thobe if it wasn't for Elijah Muhammad. It's like, first of all, Muslims was wearing thobes way before Elijah Muhammad popped on the scene. Ask anybody in Newark. Ask anybody in Philly. Muslims been wearing thobes in Philly way before the Nation of Islam even popped up. What are you talking about? If it wasn't for Elijah Muhammad, I wouldn't be wearing a thobe? You think he brought Islam to America? How, how deluded are you? <laughs> how deluded? Then you see at Malcolm's, uh, at Malcolm's Janazah, you saw one brother with the gutra on and the, and the, the thobe on. You know who that was? <laughs> Do you even know who that was? That was Muhammad Jabir from Elizabeth. <laughs> they were wearing thobes, Sunni Muslims. They were wearing thobes way before the nation of Islam. And you have the audacity to tell me, we get into an argument in a barbershop. He tell me, you, if it wasn't for Elijah Muhammad, you wouldn't be wearing a thobe. It's like, boy, go have several seats, man. What are you talking about? Anyway, murder in Islam is a very serious offense that not only affects the, the person that was murdered, and those family members of the person that was murdered, but it also affects everyone that is connected or affiliated or associated with that individual in one way or another. Um, when they killed Malcolm, they killed all of us. They killed Malcolm, they killed all of us. They killed an entire nation of people. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says this in the Quran explicitly. Because disregard for one life is disregard for all life. If you would have the gall to pull a trigger and murder somebody and take them off of this earth, you don't have regard for anybody's life. If you will take one life, you'll take all lives. It's no distinction. This is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, من أجل ذلك كتبنا على بني إسرائيل أن من قتل نفسا بغير نفس أو فساد في الأرض فكأنما قتل الناس جميعا ومن أحياها فكأنما أحيا الناس جميعا ولقد جاءتهم رسلنا بالبينات ثم إن كثير منهم بعد ذلك في الأرض لمصرفون الله سبحانه وتعالى says in سورة المائدة سورة number five آية thirty two Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, and because of this, we have decreed upon Bani Israel that anyone who takes a life without due right or because of some facade or some corruption in the earth, then it is, it is as if he has taken all lives. 
It's as if he has killed all of mankind because disregard for one life is disregard for all lives. Fact. Disregard for one life is disregard for all lives. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَنْ أَحْيَاهَا فَكَأَنَّمَا أَحْيَا النَّاسَ جَمِيعًا And whoever gives life, whoever saves a life or gives a life, then is as if he has given life to all of mankind. Because to respect and value the life of one person is to respect and value the life of all persons, all individuals, with no exception. So they didn't just kill. The title of the documentary was Who Killed Malcolm X? They didn't kill Malcolm X. They killed all of us. They killed all of us. Look at Betty Shabazz's face. The day that he was murdered and they're shoving microphones in her face, trying to get her to give a statement, to give a comment. This woman is paralyzed. You can see it in her face. Paralyzed. Because of what she knew. She's sitting there like this. They're shoving microphones in her face. And she just, a, just a silence, a dead silence. The insensitivity, because all they're concerned with is, you know, a story. Obviously, they didn't give a damn about Malcolm. They cleaned up the ballroom and had a party at the ballroom, 7 o'clock that night. <laughs> the podium that he was shot at. The podium where he was standing on, where he was shot, it was bullet holes in the podium, which could have been used as evidence in court, was downstairs buried under some stuff in the basement. They didn't give a damn about Malcolm's death. They wanted him dead. They wanted him dead. They didn't give a damn about his death. They cleaned up the ballroom that afternoon, right after that, after the police left. They cleaned up the ballroom and they had a party. They had a dance. Seven o'clock that night, later on that night. They didn't care. This is an injustice that was done to an individual. And here we are, you know, decades later, you know, trying to bring some type of justice, man. SubhanAllah, man. Trying to bring this man, you know, some type of justice, so that before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I, I can say that although that happened long before me, I did my part with respect to the Muslim community to make sure that as Abdurrahman mentioned in the uh, documentary, that what is all of this for? Historical facts. Let's get the facts straight so we can rest in peace, so we can stop living with the lie. Historical facts. That's all this is about. Someone can say, well, well, what is all of this for? <laughs> right? Historical facts. So when history is told, there's no discrepancies. When history is told, there are no discrepancies. There was an incident that was mentioned in Sahih al-Bukhari. I want to show you how Prophet Muhammad sallam, dealt with murder and how he dealt with an injustice as it relates to murder. I want to show you what our religion says. What Islam says. And how Prophet Muhammad وسلم, a true prophet, how he dealt with the injustice. The injustice of a murder. In Sahih al-Bukhari. The Prophet وسلم, as it was mentioned on the authority of Abdullah ibn Umar, that the Prophet وسلم, sent Khalid ibn Walid and a group from amongst the Muslims to Bani Jathima -Islam, to call them to Islam. Aslamna. They didn't know how to say Aslamna, we submit in those particular words. So they were saying Sabatna, Sabatna which in their language, in their dialect of Arabic, it meant the same thing, meaning we submit, we're Muslims. But they weren't saying it the way Khalid wanted them to say it. And the word sabatna was a word that Quraysh used to use to define Muslims, basically saying that they apostated from 
the traditional idolatry of their forefathers. So they would say they are, you know, sabatum, like you, you've apostated from our religion, meaning you are followers of Muhammad. So when they were using the word sabatana, meaning we've submitted, Khalid thought that they meant that they apostated. And so what did Khalid ibn Walid do? He began killing them. Now, Abdullah ibn Umar and many of the Sahaba are there. He's killing some of them and he's taking others captive. They're running, fleeing, running away from Khalid ibn Walid. Khalid kills a few of them and then takes a couple of them captive. And he passes some of them off to Abdullah ibn Umar and others that are with him. The very next day, Khalid called himself giving them an opportunity to get it right. And then he told Abdullah ibn Umar and others, the, the captives that you have, kill them. So Abdullah ibn Umar said, Wallahi la aqtul asiri. I'm not going to kill my captive. I'm not doing it. I'm going against you. I'm not going to kill him. That's not what the Prophet Wasallam sent us here to do. I'm not going to kill him. And all of the other Sahaba opposed Khalid ibn Walid until they got back to Medina. When they got back to Medina, they told the Prophet Sallallahu what Khalid had did. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi pay attention to how he rectified. We're talking about an injustice that was done. An injustice that was done to a group of people where some people were murdered. They were murdered by someone in a delegation that was sent by the Prophet Sallallahu This comes back to him. So if you're saying, oh, the nation of Islam didn't have anything to do with murdering Malcolm, then where was the rectification? Where was the rectification? You let two people, innocent individuals, go to prison. You know, as the guy mentioned when, you know, when the affidavit was dropped, there should have been uproar. There was none. <laughs> there was no uproar. Even, you know, um, uh, Wally Muslim, when they were interviewing him at King's and, you know, one of the brothers kind of got a little indignant with him and he was like, well, didn't some, didn't people go to jail for that? It's like, yeah, people went to jail for that, but it wasn't the right person. <laughs> How are you going to say, all right, somebody went to jail for it. They locked somebody up for it. So that's it. <laughs> they locked somebody up for it and that's it. The guy clearly said these two individuals was innocent. They had nothing to do with it. Did the nation of Islam step forward and say anything? No. Let them guys rot in jail. One of them, alhamdulillah, came home, made it home after 22 years. The other one died in prison. Two innocent individuals that had absolutely nothing to do with nothing. But let me show you what a real leader does when... Murder, injustice happens. Once they got back to Medina and told the Prophet Sallallahu what Khalid did, the Prophet Sallallahu gathered a group from the Sahaba, gathered the community together, and he said, Allahumma inni abra'u ila ilayka bima fa'ala Khalid. He said, oh Allah, in front of you, I am free from what Khalid did. I have nothing to do with that. I did not order Khalid to do that. I am free from his actions. I have nothing to do with that. That's the way you rectify. You clarify. This man is wrong. I have nothing to do with that. Then the Prophet ﷺ went to the tribes of the individuals who were murdered and he paid the blood money for them. Compensation. As our religion instructs us, you take someone's life there has to be either a life for a life or there's blood money to be paid, a dia. Compensation for the loss. Not just the loss of the lives, but the family that have to deal with that. The Prophet ﷺ was sensitive, sensitive enough to know that murder doesn't just affect the person that was slain. The family got to deal with it. The tribe got to deal with it. The community got to deal with it. Here again, woman, for the one who saves a life, the one who is concerned about a life is as if he is concerned about all life. That's what I'm talking about. That's what a real leader does. He stood in front of the community and said, I have nothing to do with what Khalid did, meaning I did not order him to do that. That was, those were his own actions. 
And then he went and he paid the blood money to the families of the people that Khalid Ibn Walid killed. Not as uh, Amin Nathari mentioned in the, in the documentary, I was kind of appalled. I was a little shocked, to be honest with you. Amin stated that at the end of the video that we can't say who is entitled to Allah's forgiveness or who's not. You know, the guy, Al Mustafa Shabazz, he made Hajj and therefore he returns home like the day his mother gave birth to him. This is as it relates to the sins that are between. Let me let me correct this, because I was listening to YouTube and I, and I heard this non-Muslim guy and he criticized Islam and Muslims as a result of that. He said Muslims will sit around and condemn Christians for, you know, turning the other cheek or doing this or doing that. He said, but then Muslims you know, will know that another Muslim, one of their own, is guilty of a murder, and then you exonerate him because he went and performed Hajj, he went and he performed some acts of worship, and so now he's no longer responsible for spilling somebody's blood? This is a non-Muslim criticizing Islam because of a comment that was made by Amin Nathari that he had no authority to make. So you're going to exonerate this man and I'm not saying whether he will be forgiven or not. That's not my issue. That's not my argument. My argument is to correct the comment that he made using Hodge as a vindication for the act of murder that this man was guilty of. That doesn't vindicate you. In that case, anybody can go murder anybody and then go make Hodge and say, well, I returned home like the day my mother gave birth. That's with conditions. That's as it relates to the sins that are between you and God. As it relates to the sins between you and another human being, it doesn't work like that. The martyr in Islam, the person who dies on the battlefield, from an Islamic standpoint, he goes straight to paradise. Unless... There is a ha, there is a right that he owes to another human being. In that case, he will not go straight to paradise, even if he died on the battlefield and lost his life fighting for Islam. You understand? Because you have a hawk, you have a right that belongs to another human being. It doesn't work like that. You don't get vindicated, exonerated, because you go and perform hajj when you have sins that are in the balance between you and another human being. It doesn't work like that. Even with forgiveness, the Prophet Sallallahu said that if you wrong a Muslim, anyone who wrongs his brother in Islam, that Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala will not forgive him until at first he goes and seeks forgiveness from his brother. This is as it relates to forgiveness. Your forgiveness is on hold with between you and God until you rectify that situation between you and the individual that you wronged. You can't say a person made Hodge, and so therefore we can't say whether or not. No, we can't say whether or not he'll be forgiven. But we will say is that he will be, he will be questioned about that, without a doubt. He took a hawk from somebody. He took a right from somebody. And as the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, The first, pay attention to this hadith, the first people, the first people to be judged on the day of judgment. The first thing that will be judged between people, the arbitration will start with blood. The arbitration between contending individuals on the day of judgment will start with blood, meaning murder, spilling people's blood, you know, fighting, you know, whatever the case may be. If there was any bloodshed, those will be the first people to be judged. Those will be the first situations to be judged on the day of judgment. Fiddima. Blood.
And you sit here and say, well, because he made Hodge, nobody can say blah, blah, blah. Man, that's the same stuff we say when we tell the sister, oh, be patient, inshallah. Make dua. These same run-of-the-mill responses that we give to people when we don't really know what the hell we're talking about. It's just appalling, man. And now you've said something that is now public information and now non-Muslims have the, you know, the luxury now to criticize Islam for something else due to an uh, inaccurate comment that was made by somebody who had no business even opening their mouths. Are you serious, man? I'm sitting here listening to the shake in my head like, and no, he didn't just say that. That's like making matters worse. <laughs> it's like, Hey, come on, man. You serious? Even when Osama ibn Zayd, him and his companion, they caught the non-Muslim guy in between the, the rock. And when Osama lifted his sword up to kill the guy, the guy said, La, la ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. And the companion from the Ansar, he said, I just backed off of him. He said, he took his shahada. I'm going to leave it at that. I backed off of him. Usama said, I kept stabbing him with my spear until he died. He said, and when I got back to Medina to tell the Prophet ﷺ what happened, the Prophet said to Usama, Did you kill the man after he said, La ilaha illallah? This is the Prophet having a conversation with Usama. And this was his beloved, Hubb Rasulullah sallallahu he was the most beloved of the youth of the Sahaba to the Prophet ﷺ. The Prophet said to him, Did you kill him, Osama? After he said, La ilaha illallah, Osama said, Yes. He only said it because he knew I was gonna, he knew I was gonna kill him. And the Prophet asked him, Did you open his heart to see whether or not he really believed? This is the kicker. At the end of the hadith, hadith is collected in Sahih Muslim. The Prophet ﷺ said, Ya Usama. As Usama kept saying to the Prophet ﷺ, Ya Rasulullah, istaghfirli. O Messenger of Allah, ask Allah for forgiveness for me. Ask Allah for forgiveness for me. And the Prophet ﷺ said, Kayfa tasna bi la ilaha illallah, Ya Usama, yawm al qiyamah. Ida ja'at yawm al qiyamah. He said, Usama, what are you going to do about his statement, La ilaha illallah, when it comes on the day of judgment? How are you going to answer Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Killing a man after he said la ilaha illallah. This is the prophet scolding one of his companions. He didn't just let that ride. You're my companion. Allah knows what your intention was. So therefore, no harm, no foul. La wallahi. La wallahi. He said, Did you kill that man after he said la ilaha illallah? Usama said, Istaghfirli, Ya Rasulullah. Usama said, oh, Messenger of Allah, ask Allah for forgiveness for me, please. I'm sorry. The Prophet said, bi la ilaha illallah idha al qiyamah. He said, Usama, what are you going to do about his statement, la ilaha illallah, when it comes on the day of judgment? You got to answer to Allah for that, man. This was the Prophet's companion. And you have the audacity to tell me that because a man shot a man in public, in broad daylight, in front of his family, in front of his children, sawed off shotgun, you blasted this man in front of his family. And then you walk away and you have, as a Muslim, conscious Muslim, have the audacity to say, well, he made hard, so I can't really say and we don't want to be judgmental of people, but, but man, miss me. We have selective religiosity. Selective religiosity. We're religious with the people we want to be religious with. Because quiet is kept. Some, some I ain't going to say no names, but some same individuals would never even extend anything like that to me. <laughs> you talk about me like a dog behind my back. But yet you make a million and one excuses for the people that you want to make excuses for. Selective religiosity. Yeah. And let's call it what it is. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, Inna Allaha la yaghdab idha mudiha al-fasiq. 
The Prophet Sallallahu said that Allah gets angry when a fasik, when a sinful, rebellious individual is praised. This is when speaking truth to power becomes a little difficult. And you can't really say because you're held back by the cultural traditions that, you know, we still live in by street rules and street cred and all that other bull crap that we bring with us into the fold of Islam. The niggatry that we bring with us into the fold of Islam. Niggatry. We can't, we take it with us everywhere we go. It's our baggage. It's our cultural baggage. We can't leave it in the streets where it is. We got to bring it with us every single place that we go. Selective religiosity. We're religious with the people we want to be religious with. And then, you know, we throw the whole book at, you know. <coughs> Mashallah. We oftentimes say that when we know better, we do better. But we didn't do better when we knew better when it came to Malcolm X. We say we do when we know better, we do better. We say that all the time. But we didn't do better when we knew better. It was common knowledge to many in the North area who killed Malcolm X, even amongst those who eventually converted to uh, the true teachings of Islam. Yet not much was done in terms of bringing closure to this situation, this particular chapter. And, and here we are today having this discussion about it. It is the responsibility of those who know to, you know, to know the truth, to establish justice. What else are you doing with the truth? What else are you doing with the truth other than establishing justice? What is the purpose of having truth if you're not going to use it to establish justice? And die for it in the process. I mean, that's what people who love truth, we understand that those are the consequences that come along with it. In episode two, um, Straight Man in a Crooked Game, the teacher at uh, Malcolm X Shabazz High School, and they even named the high school after him in North, right? They even named the high school after him. I mean, just the irony in that. And I've known Malcolm X Shabazz High School there in North for many years. But now that this information comes out that North, you know, secretly had a hatred, not all of North, but many, most in the city of North during that time, because it was a stronghold for the nation of Islam, had a, had a disdain. Even when you look at the documentary and you can see people still to this very day have a disdain for Malcolm, have a dislike, a hatred for him. I'm guessing the same will be about me years after I'm gone because I, I know, I know y'all can't stand me and, and I'm okay with that. <laughs> I don't live in your praises and I damn sure ain't going to die in your criticism. I could care less, man. I could care less. I've already lived my life. I turned my life over to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 21, 23 years ago. 23 years ago, my life belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ain't a damn thing you can do to me. My soul belongs to God, period. The only thing you want the body, you can have this. You can have this. My soul belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I turned my life over to him a long time ago. I live my life. But I'm, I'm sure the same will be said of me when I'm gone. Trust me, I, I'm not oblivious to that. But the teacher at Malcolm X Shabazz High School, he said there should have been, you know, there should have been outrage. He said there should have been outrage uh, when the affidavit was dropped about Malcolm X and the, the real killers. And Amin Nathari, again, he said that they tried to contain it. These were his words. The people in North, the Muslims in North, they tried to contain it. They weren't going to be the ones to let it out. But if it got out, you know, it just did, you know. 
And this is similar to, you know, street rules, basically. You know, we Muslim, but, you know, we're not going to put it out there. We're not going to say anything. You know, basically, we're not going to snitch on him. They couldn't snitch on him because he was working with the feds anyway. So there was no need to snitch. The, the cops already, the feds already knew who it was. They hired him to do the hit. He said, but if it got out, it just got out. You know, but we weren't going to be the ones to spread it. And this is similar to what happens in many black families, you know. And even if it did get out, you know, what they end up doing is shaming the victim for exposing it rather than the perpetrators who are responsible for it. That's the culture that we live in. We victim shame. We shame the victim, not the perpetrator. We shame the victim. That's the whole snitching, you know, concept of snitching. So person gets murdered in front of my house. I call the police. I'm a... I'm a citizen. I'm not in the drug game. I'm not in the street game. I, I get up. I'm a working citizen, tax paying citizen. Crime was committed in front of my house. I pick up the phone. I call the cops or whatever the case may be. Now I'm shamed for snitching on people. Matter of he just murdered somebody. But I'm shamed for picking up the phone and calling the authorities, right? Because according to their rules, I should have just turn my eyes. I should have just, you know, this is sick, right? It's a sick culture that we live in. Same thing that happens in, you know, in our families, the girl is molested, boy is molested. And then we'll shame him or shame her for saying something. So when he or she comes out and say, mom, you know, your, your, your boyfriend molested me or your, my stepfather molested me, Right. We'll shame the girl. Why are you saying something now? How do you know? Blah, blah, blah. We'll take her through the whole nine. We'll shame her, right? Rather than the perpetrator of the behavior. That's the culture. That's part of black culture. We'll shame the victim. We'll shame the victim. Not the person, you know, the perpetrator of the behavior. Right. And as a people, we have to learn to stand in the discomfort of our truth. We don't like to be discomforted. We don't like to feel uncomfortable and we'll do anything to wiggle our way out of that feeling of being uncomfortable. So as a people, we have to learn how to stand in the discomfort of truth. Truth is not always easy to stand in. It's not. But we have to learn how, you know, we're people of truth, we're lovers of truth, then we have to learn how to stand in that discomfort. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, one of his names is Al-Haq. He is the truth, which means that he will aid all truth that leads to justice. He will aid all truth that leads to justice. The other thing is the hypocrisy of our community with respect to Brother Malcolm, that as African-Americans, we have a tendency to crucify our leaders. I want you guys to pay attention. As African-Americans, another theme that I see kind of replaying itself is that we have a tendency to crucify our leaders, much like Benny Israel, you know, we crucify the leaders and then we embrace our enemies. We crucify our leaders and we embrace our enemies all the time. When you, you know, we'll sing a person's praises so as long as they conform to the status quo. But the moment they go against the way things are, rightfully so, because when a person has knowledge, they're acting upon their knowledge. We'll praise people. Oh, mashallah, he got so much knowledge. I remember people used to brag and argue who was the most knowledgeable Salafi. Is it this one or Fulan or Fulan and he's more knowledgeable or this one? And, you know, but how many people that you claim that are so knowledgeable actually work with their knowledge? Malcolm became problematic because he became an embodiment of his own teaching. It became problematic. That's when you become problematic for anybody. When you become a byproduct 
of your own teaching. And that's exactly what Malcolm became. See, it's all fun and games when we're reading from a book, sitting on a musalla, and we sound good. But when we start implementing that stuff and changing, going against the status quo and making people feel uncomfortable, oh, no, now you become a problem. It's just like, well, why did I go overseas and study Islam? Why did I learn about the religion if y'all was going to crucify me for following it? You understand? Why? Why go learn Islam when I'm about to become an embodiment of what I'm learning only to become public enemy number one in the same damn community that encouraged me to go learn the religion to begin with? I'm speaking about myself personally. It's all fun and games when you're just reading from a book and the shake said, and you're, you know, following the footsteps of those who came before you, you know, you ain't going to bust a grape in a fruit fight. You're not going to do anything. You're not going to change anything. You're not going to challenge or change anything. But the moment the light bulb goes off and you start to now become an embodiment of what you are learning and what you are teaching, now you become problematic because it's like, no, knowledge is just for fluff. It's just for fluff. It's just for aesthetics. You're not supposed to act on that stuff. You just learn it. You sound good. You put on a thobe. You grow your beard. You, you have a prostration mark and you walk around looking religious. You're not supposed to really start implementing that stuff. You understand? You're not really supposed to start implementing that. You're supposed to just learn and sound good, not come home and start ruffling feathers, not come home and start calling out injustice, not come home and start calling out, you know, the figureheads of Islam in the community ruffling feathers. Oh, that's not what you're supposed to do. Because when you do that, now you become a problem. And people who convert to Islam, much like Malcolm, when you convert to something, you come in just so green. And you don't really know the inner workings and the politics that go on behind the scenes. And, you know, you, you slowly start to catch on. And then you come to a fork in the road. You can either, you know, play the game, follow the script, or you can work by your knowledge and create your own script. And in doing that, there are consequences to that. There are consequences to that. I'm living proof of that. There are consequences to that. People don't want that energy. You know, they don't want you bringing that energy to their masjid. They don't want you bringing that energy. Nah, because mm -mm, you're problematic. <laughs> you're a problem. You know why I'm a problem? I'm a problem because I'm... I'm actually becoming an embodiment of the message that I preach. When in, in our culture, you're not supposed to do that. You're supposed to just learn for aesthetic purposes, for, for the fluff, to look good, to say you're a sheikh, put sheikh on the front of your name and be on a flyer every other week, flying around and, you know, talking about, you know, a version of Islam that only exists in textbooks. That, that's what you're supposed to be doing. Not, not calling yourself a sheikh and actually flying around, you know, giving lectures at places or using social media and talking about Islam that actually doesn't happen in textbooks, but happens in real life. Now you become problematic. You're a problem. You're a problem. And all of them gather together against you. That's a fact. They all in cahoots, all of them, all of them. You see their names on flyers and together, they're all in cahoots, all of them. I don't have to call out no names. You guys, anybody with two eyes can see what's going on here. If, you, if you're in the blind at this point, you probably deserve to stay exactly where you are. If you woke at this point and you can see what's going on in our communities, man, then kudos to you, man. Kudos to you. But if you're still sitting here talking about, well, what is he talking about? I don't even know what he's talking about. Stay exactly where you are. You don't need to know what I'm talking about. Because the truth will blow your mind. You're not ready for this. 
the truth will blow your mind. So this is the hypocrisy of our community. You know, we crucify our leaders and we embrace our enemies. We crucify our leaders and we embrace our enemies. We sing the person's praises so as long as they conform to the status quo, the moment they go against the way that things are, rightfully so, because the person should be following his knowledge, now all of a the sudden they are a problem. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told the Prophet wasallam because prophets and messengers go through the same thing. Allah told the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Allah told the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Follow what has been sent to you from your Lord. That is what you follow. Nothing else. Not the desires of others. Not the opinions of others. Not the status quo. Not, you know, the, 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 the leader, the hegemony who controls the status quo. No. Follow what has been revealed to you from your Lord, despite the way that it rubs other people, despite how other people may feel, despite the fact that you are going against the grain, despite the fact that you are upsetting the status quo, despite the fact that you are upsetting the social order, follow what has been revealed to you from your Lord. That is a direct command from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And some people just, you know, they're going to follow 20% of that, 30% of that, 40, 50 but it's very few that become a complete embodiment of that. And this is why when they came to the house of Aisha and they asked Aisha, Kaifa kana khuruk in Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, how was the character of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the home? What did Aisha say? She said, Allah taqra'un al Quran. Don't you read the Quran? Kana khurukuhu al Quran. His character was the Quran, he was an embodiment of every single ayah in the Qur'an, 6,300 and some odd verses that are in the Qur'an, he is an embodiment of every single ayah. You understand? She said, don't you read the Qur'an? Kana khurukuhu al-Qur'an. He is a complete embodiment of the Qur'an. That's when you become problematic. As we know, they used to call the Prophet wasallam al-Ameen, the trustworthy one. And then he went from Al-Amin to being Sahir, to being a magician, Kadab, liar, Majnoon, crazy, Sha'ir, you know, he's a poet, mad poet. It's like, how does he go from being Al-Amin to all of these mean, negative, derogatory terms that y'all came up with? What happened between Al-Amin and Kadab, Sahir, Sha'ir? <laughs> what happened between those two? Like, how did it go from there to there? question. A person doesn't just go from being, mashallah, Salafi to he's, he's a Kafir. <laughs> you understand? What happened? How did he go from being Salafi in the Salafi community? Translating for the scholars. Everybody coming to the conference and lecture to listen to him. He go from being Salafi to a Kafir? Did I miss something? What happened? I, I'm really confused. He went from being Salafi to Mubtedia? Kafir? Hypocrite? I've been called it all. What happened? What happened between those two? Somewhere along the line, you, you upset something or someone's. You know. I mean, he said, as it relates to Malcolm, he said, no one would say anything against Malcolm. So as long as pay attention to this, he said, no one would say anything against Malcolm. So as long as his relationship was in good standing with Elijah Muhammad, pay attention. He said, no one would say anything against him. So as long as he was in good standing with Elijah Muhammad. He said, but once that relationship went south, those who had issues with him before, 
now had a platform to express how they felt. Meaning, as long as he was in good, following the status quo, you know, making Elijah Muhammad feel comfortable, he was good. Nobody was going to say anything about him. Even though they had a deep hatred for him and envy for him behind the scenes. There were people who had issues with him. Long before he had the fallout with the nation. But nobody would say anything against him. So as long as his relationship with Elijah Muhammad was intact. He said, but once that relationship went south, those who had issues with him before now had a platform to be able to, you know, unleash the beast. Right. They begin to now speak freely about how they felt about him. This is similar to what happened in the Salafi communities. Right. As long as Sheikh Rabia or Sheikh Fulan or Sheikh Fulan was cool with you singing your praises, it's all good. Those who had issues with you could not come out publicly. They would talk in a roundabout way amongst themselves in their little jealous, envious little circles. Right. Like little kids. In their little jealous circles, you know, they'll, they'll, your, your name will come up in a, you know, in a, in a plethora of, you know, derogatory ways. But they couldn't come out public with it because, you know, the sheikh was still cool with you. But the moment that relationship with the sheikh goes south, sheikh kind of gives you a green light. Oh, everything comes out. All the stuff that they had been holding back you know what I mean? All the stuff they've been holding back for so long, oh, they can now give you the business. You're everything in the book. So this is the latent, you know, resentment and hatred and disdain that we have for our leaders. I heard people say stuff about me. I, I actually thought we were cool until, you know, the gloves was off. And it's just like, damn, I didn't know you really felt like that about me. I know now, but... I always thought it was, you know, it was all good, but I guess I was wrong, you know, because now people can, they have a justification to treat you a certain way, to talk to you a certain way, to talk about you in a certain way, because now, you know, the Sheikh has kind of given the green light. So this is the same thing that went on in the Salafi community. People don't really like you. Now, people never really liked me, to be honest with you. Even from the days of the Islamic University, people never really liked me. Don't fool yourself. Don't fool yourself. People never really liked you, right? But they reserve their sentiments until it is popular to expose it. You know, and this is usually the end result of low-level thinking. You know, you think about how many, you know, reputations. I talk about how we kill our leaders in the African-American Muslim community. You know, you think about how many reputations that have been destroyed in the African-American Muslim Sunni community. Not a single student of knowledge, not a single African-American. You do the math. Some of you might still be suffering from the residual, you know, taint of my name. So you're listening, but you like, you know, you're cringing as you're listening, as the minutes go by. But do me a favor. Pay attention to the pattern of behavior, and it's not a coincidence. Not a single African-American student of knowledge has graduated from the Islamic University, especially Medina, especially Medina. The biggest threat to the African-American Muslim community, whether amongst the Salafis or the non-Salafis, the general body of the Muslims, the single threat, the single most Serious threat to the African-American Muslim community is an African-American graduate from the Islamic University of Medina. That's a fact. He is the single threat. And God forbid, don't let him come from New Jersey, New York, or Philadelphia and not be involved in any shenanigans and actually becomes an embodiment of his own message. You are a threat everywhere you go. There's nothing more threatening than a street dude who is now woke. 
because you know both sides. <laughs> you know both sides. You still got your street smarts from before you became Muslim, before you started practicing Islam. And now you have the knowledge to go along with it. God forbid, you know Arabic, you can open up the books, you can crack the books open, you can read directly from the sources. You are a threat. And you are seen as such. In the general masses of the Muslims, you are a threat because everybody is, you know, afraid that you're going to share a platform with them and you're going to over, you're going to overshadow them. You're going to outshine them. So they don't want to lecture alongside of you. They don't want to lecture alongside of you because the fear is I'm going to sit on a podium with this guy who's a graduate from the Islamic University of Medina and this guy going to make me look like a complete ignoramus, which you are, but, you know, in the land of the blind, the one-eyed man is king, right? In the land of the blind, the one-eyed man is king. When you are lecturing alongside people who are just as mediocre as you are or less than knowledge than, less in knowledge than you are, obviously you look like the man. But you sit alongside somebody who can run off Arabic and give you the tefsir, give you what the scholar said and fiqh and usul fiqh and can give you the breakdown of this and that, man. People not even paying attention to you no more. They paying attention to him. And that's their biggest fear. That's their biggest fear. The Salafis are afraid of you because now, you know, the same thing. <laughs> they can no longer walk around, you know, with their thobes on, you know, all the way up to their knees and, you know, with a book in their hand and, you know, jumping from musalla to musalla, you know, as the man, you know, marrying the sisters, you know, they can't do that anymore. Because now you represent a thorn in their side, you know. But think about how many African-American graduates from Medina who nobody can say anything about. Give me one. I'll wait. Give me one. That there's no dark cloud, no taint on him. <laughs> Give me one. I'll wait. That nobody has said anything negative about, he's fine, you can take from him. None of the scholars have warned against him. None of the brothers have said he has issues because that's what they say about everybody. And it's so vague and it's so, you know, what does that even mean? He has issues. And then you're not even allowed to, you know, you're not even allowed to uh, uh, ask any questions about that. It's like, oh, he has issues. What do you mean he has issues? Oh, so now you team so-and-so and they'll start shaming you for asking questions and you just legitimately don't understand what's his problem? Why does he have issues? And you just want a genuine answer and they can't even give it to you. It's almost like, you know, Christianity, when you ask them, well, why did Jesus have to die for the sins of mankind when Adam ate from the tree? He asked God for forgiveness. Or why would God hold all of mankind accountable for the sin of Adam so much so that he has to send his only begotten son to, you know what I mean? And while right, I should block you for saying that. Matter of fact, I don't even believe you just said that, man. Yeah. I'm sorry. He can email me later and we can discuss that in private, but you just pissed me off with that. This guy just had the nerve to say Anwar right? <laughs> Gotta be kidding me. Anwar wrong, you mean? Gotta be kidding me, man. But I'm going somewhere with this. I want you to pay attention to something. Pay attention to something. There's not one African-American graduate from the Islamic University or any other place that there is no taint on his name. Imams, preachers, you know, their nobody's reputation has survived the Salafi destruction of our communities. Nobody's reputation has survived. And anyone's name has a dark cloud of he said, she said, the sheikh said, you know, hovering over it. And this is not a coincidence. It's not a coincidence. When you look at the FBI counterintelligence protocols 
they read like the exact same script that is followed by these extreme Salafis. Pay attention. Make the connection, please. I'm going to give you the four protocols of the FBI. Four protocols of the FBI. Listen closely. This is what J. Edgar Hoover and the FBI, this is, you know, their protocols. Number one, prevention of the coalition of militant black nationalist groups, i.e. no unity amongst black groups. Regardless if they're religious, socialist, whatever their movements are, no unity. Prevention of the coalition of militant black nationalist groups. That's number one. Number two, preventing the rise of a messiah who could unify and electrify the militant black nationalist movement, meaning no leader. First one, no unity. Second one, no leader. Prevent the rise of a messiah who could unify, electrify uh, the militant black nationalist groups. No unity, no leader. Number three, here's the kicker. Prevent black nationalist groups and leaders from gaining respectability by discrediting them to the community. By discrediting them to the community. No honor. No unity. No leader. No credibility. Think that's a coincidence? You, do you still think that they're following these same protocols now? Or with the creation of the internet and social media and all of these fake accounts, right? These ghost accounts that are created. Stuff was said about me, said about other people from ghost accounts. You don't know where the hell these accounts come from. I've had people inbox me, call me deviant, call me a hypocrite. I mean, ghost accounts. Ghost accounts. Clearly ghost accounts. These are not, these are not Muslims. <laughs> these are not Muslims. And then you have these accounts that are created where they launch an entire, you know, oh, Shadi Muhammad the Deviant. And then you see YouTube pages and, you know, you never know who is actually behind this stuff. You never actually know who is actually responsible for putting that stuff out there. Nobody. You never know. <laughs> Prevent a black militant nationalist groups and leaders from gaining respectability by discrediting them to the community. We're going to discredit you. Any graduate that comes from the Islamic University, African American, we are going to discredit you. We're going to destroy your honor. We're going to discredit you to the community. So there's barely anything left of you. There will be a taint over my head until I die, even after I die. I just pray that my, my narrative is, you know, written in the, in the right way. The, the historical facts are straight. And the last one, number four, is to prevent a long range growth of militant black nationalist organizations, especially amongst the youth, meaning no growth, no future, no unity, no leader, no honor and no future. These are protocols. These are spelled out. There's actually a documentary on Netflix it talks about the history of the FBI with black nationalist groups. Go and watch that and you'll see what I'm talking about. Do you think, <laughs> do you think that uh, all of this is a coincidence? Do you think that th they are still not operating with these protocols? If you think that, you a fool. If you think that all of these, you know, web Sites and web pages and selfie.com and selfie pubs and selfie this, selfie that, selfie this, selfie that. Don't you know, as I told you guys before, most of those pages are ran by the same organization, selfie publications, selfie.net, selfie this, selfie that, selfie this, selfie that. They own all of those domains. 
anything seller for you try to buy a donate domain name of anything affiliated or associated with seller for you, it's already purchased. And I would bet my life on it if I could that they're all owned, operated, and affiliated with the same group and organization. Yeah. This stuff might not make sense to you now. Maybe you guys got to revisit this stuff 30 years from now. Who knows? You know, maybe I'm, I'm a little ahead of my time. But if you're not smart enough to see what's going on here, I'm, as I said before, maybe you belong exactly where you are. This is not a coincidence. It's not a coincidence that every time an African-American student graduates from university, comes back to his community and you know, tries to plant his feet firmly, you know what I mean, into the community to begin helping the community, he's crucified by his own people. So this is the paradox. This is the hypocrisy. If you look at those four protocols, I broke those four protocols down into main concepts. No unity. We haven't had any unity. There's no unity. <laughs> Even more so now that Selfie pubs and, and their group are probably not even relevant anymore. It's probably less unity now, even amongst those who don't need, don't actually even agree with that stuff. It's probably less unity now than there ever was. No leader. There's no leader amongst us. <laughs> I don't even think it would be wise to have one leader from amongst us. I don't even think that would be wise. Because then you become a target. <laughs> There's no honor. Nobody trusts anybody's honor. Nobody doesn't trust anybody. And number four, no growth, no future. No growth, no future. I mean, stop me when I'm lying. I was listening to this um, this YouTube video. I'm forgetting the guy's name, um, but he kind of gave his take on the documentary, and he said something that was very profound. Very, I, th I found it to be very interesting. He said the Nation of Islam recruited from the poor sectors of the black community. He said thus they were elevated into discourse without restraint and without a deeper understanding as it relates to, uh, you know, and, and the lessons, the deeper understanding and the lessons, as well as the respect for black leadership. They were elevated into discourse without restraint, which led to a lack of respect for black leadership. And that's exactly what happened in the Muslim community. The Salafis, you know, kind of removed, you know, and brought everybody into the discussion. There were, there were no... Um, leaders sitting at the table discussing these matters. Lay people were calling, you know, oh, Tarheer Wyatt is a stray. He's a hisbi. He's this. this. And you, you ask the person, well, what is a hisbi? He don't even know what a hisbi is. But here again, elevated into discourse without restraint, which leads to the lack of respect for leadership. So the Salafis, they removed the restraints that were holding people back you know what I mean? Keeping people back that were ignorant and only the people that had knowledge would speak. And now you go into the prisons. You know what I mean? Like, I, I talked to Ali Davis. He was like, man, he had to, he was a chaplain at the prison. He's like, he had to quit. You know, he resigned because the, the, the prison system becomes so toxic because the guys in the prison system, they're like, here it is. You were incarcerated. You serve in 10 years, 15 years, whatever. You need to go take from somebody. You talking about, oh, I don't take from you. It's like, you, dude, you're in prison. You don't have much options. You don't have many options. And you sitting around talking about, oh, I don't take from you. He was like, man, I had to quit. <laughs> Joint was toxic as hell. Toxic. <laughs> How is it that you going into the prison trying to impart some knowledge onto, you know I me, mean, inmates and then, you know, have them challenging you, most of them criminals, you know what I mean? Like, 
you have a criminal history, criminal life. As a Muslim, you are a criminal. I'm talking about you were a criminal. You came to prison, you converted to Islam. You came to the prison as a Muslim with a prostration mark on your forehead. And you sitting here talking about who you take from and who you don't take from. It's like, dude, you ought to take from somebody. Get your damn life together. <laughs> you sitting around like you got the luxury to say who you take from and who you don't take from. But that's exactly what the Salafis did. They go into the prison system and they begin recruiting from the prison. The same way the Nation of Islam recruited from the poor sectors of the black community. Thus, ignorant people are elevated into discourse without restraint, and it produces a generation of people who have a lack of respect for authority, lack of respect for leadership, because everyone now is entitled to an opinion. Meanwhile, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala clarifies that matters of you know, public concern should be the collective responsibility of the higher thinking individuals in the community. The higher thinking individuals in the community. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, when it comes to them some matter of fear of public safety, they rush and they go spread it. That if they were to return the affair back to the messenger and those who have been endowed with knowledge from, from amongst them, then those who have the knowledge whereby to extract the lessons from what happened would be able to disseminate that information to everybody in a manner that is conducive to their well-being. That's conducive to their well-being. This is as a result of the higher level, higher thinking individuals from amongst us and now i posted a clip on my instagram page the other day about the wali and you had every muhammad bakr zaid khadija and aisha and amina commenting well it's from the quran and the sun it's just like girl what are you talking about what are you even talking about asking for deep clarification about matters that even if i clarified it to you you still wouldn't understand this is what i'm talking about so now everybody has become a scholar in their own right. Meanwhile, we don't know our left foot from our right foot. And, and I mean, it's, it's really sad. So ignorant people will, were elevated into discourse without restraint, which produced a lack of respect for leadership. And this is exactly what happened, you know, in the Muslim community. You know, we recruit from the lower tiers of society, prisons, people getting off of drugs. When you think about the Salafi community, the African-American Salafi community in our experience here, they recruit straight from prison. There's a prison to mosque pipeline. They go into the prisons. Many of them are chaplains. Many of them are chaplains. They go, students of knowledge, they graduate from Medina or graduate from wherever they graduate from or emerge from wherever they emerge from, two years in Yemen, a year in Yemen, eight months in Egypt, whatever the case may be. It doesn't matter. Um, he comes home and he, he becomes a chaplain in the prison. If you think about it, for anyone who was familiar with the chaplaincy positions, especially in New York and New Jersey, the chaplaincy positions, um, let's say from the early 90s all the way up into about the Salafi boom around 99, 2000. From the mid 80s all the way up into the late 90s, the chaplain positions in prisons were occupied by who? Please tell me. If anyone is familiar with this. The prison, the, the chaplaincy positions were held by who? The nation of Islam. The nation of Islam. Even I filled out for a chaplaincy position some years ago, years ago. And the other guy that was, you know, filling out for the position was also a guy from the nation of Islam. 
And they ended up giving the position to, and I'm glad they did, but they ended up giving the position to the guy from the Nation of Islam and not even myself, even though I had somebody on the inside that was pushing my paperwork on the inside. And they still gave it to the guy from the Nation of Islam. So what did the Salafis do? The Salafis just read from the same script. So now you're Anwar writes, and you got these guys that are in the prison system now, you know, taking all of their material, indoctrinating the inmates, you know, with this nonsense. And now they come straight home and their loyalty is to Germantown Masjid, this Masjid, that Masjid, whatever the case may be. That's where they go. That's where they go. So they're recruiting from the lower tiers of society. Now, what's so wrong about that? Let me tell you. And this is because the same thing the Nation of Islam did with people, you clean them up outwardly. They clean up outwardly. I'm going to get to the gang mentality. Trust me, I'm going to get there. They clean up outwardly. The Nation of Islam cleaned you up outwardly, got you off drugs, came home from prison, put you in a suit and a bow tie. Might have changed your language up a little bit. You know how to mix and match words here and there. So it's the incarceration that leads to the exoneration, blah, 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 blah. You know, you, you sound good. Like you, you got your word game. Your play on words is good. All right, brother. You know what I mean? But this will be the same dude, you know, given the right situation, given the right order. It will split your wig open. All that brother stuff, man, miss me with that stuff, man. Don't call me your brother. I ain't your brother, man. I'm not your brother. You know and I know. Don't call me your brother. I ain't your brother, man. Anytime you can murder a person in cold blood and then walk around for the next X amount of years as if, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, come on. And then you have the audacity to say, hey, brother, I'm not your brother, man. Don't call me your brother. So they clean you up outwardly, but there's nothing done for the soul exactly. Look at the level of jealousy and, and envy and hatred and throat, you know, throat cutting practices, cutthroat practices, undermining and, you know, dishonorable competition that goes on, like all of that stuff. Where's all the where's the cleaning up and the rectifying of that? What made the Quran and the practice of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam so impactful upon nations of people is because it dealt with change from the internal, not the external. You came as you were. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam never changed his dress. The Sahaba said that if the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was sitting amongst a group of people and you didn't know what he looked like, you would never be able to separate him from the crowd or separate him from the group of people he was sitting amongst because it wasn't about the dress. He never changed his dress. He changed the condition of his heart. He changed the condition of the hearts of the people that were around him. One of the non-Muslims of Quraysh was sitting there listening to the Prophet ﷺ recite a surah from the Quran. He said, He was said, it was as if my heart was about to fly out of my chest. This was the impact of the Prophet ﷺ's message on the people that were around him. It wasn't take you in, clean you up, give you a bow tie and a suit and change your language up a little bit and have and send you out into the world selling papers and bean pies. That's cleaning you up. That's external cleaning. Did nothing for the internal. Did nothing for the soul. Because in essence, when you peel off the, the suit and tie and the bow tie, and you peel off all of that, what do you have? You have the same damn nigga he was before he put it on. The same nigga. And excuse my French. Excuse my nigga tree. The same Negro. Nothing, not much has changed. Not much has changed. But when you look at the Sahaba, we're talking about a nation of people who were changed from the inside out. This is why ayats like dealing with the hijab, ayats dealing with alcohol, this stuff wasn't revealed until 15 years, 18 years later. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was, you know, infusing change.
with time. But tadarruj. You understand? Tadarruj. Shayin for shayin. Bit by bit by bit. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala finally revealed the ayat about the hijab in the fifth year after hijrah, 18 years later, they were tearing the bottom of their garments and wrapping their heads and wrapping, covering their faces. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala finally revealed the ayat about alcohol, the Sahaba were pouring alcohol in the streets because the internal change, the internal, you understand? Change starts here, not let me clean you up, get you off draw. And I'm not saying that that stuff is not important. I'm not saying cleaning the person up, getting them off a draw. I'm not saying that those things weren't virtuous. I'm, that's not what I'm saying. But I'm saying it's not real change. It's not real change. You can get a person off drugs, clean them up, and they'll relapse and go back. But you can get, you can instill fear of God in the individual. And you can sit 20 bottles of alcohol in front of him, and he won't touch one. I'm a product of that. And anybody else who has converted to Islam who has never touched a drug or alcohol from the moment they converted to Islam. You ain't got to clean me up. Just give me Tawheed. <laughs> give me Tawheed. Give a whole new meaning to the whole statement. Give me liberty or give me death. Give me liberty from shirk or let me die. You understand? Like, Give me real change. Give me Tawheed and let me clean up on my own. You ain't got to clean me up. Give me Tawheed. Give me La ilaha illallah in its purest form. And I'll show you change. I'll show you change. I'm a product of it. And many of you are products of that. Real change. Real change. So this is... You know, and the thing about it is when you are recruiting from the lower levels of society, you know, these are the type of people that come home from these guys that come home from prison. In many instances, in many instances, not all, but many of them, they, these are the type of people that are easily controlled. These are the type of people, inmates that come home from prison, come into the mosque. All right. They're easily controlled. Why? Because they're never going to question anything. They're never going to question authority. They're never going to reach the level where they feel like they're actually even on par with the person that is actually teaching them. And part and parcel because guys that come home from prison, they still live by street rules, codes of the street. So in the event of some type of injustice, they're not going to turn to the kufar, right? That's, key, that's code word for not snitching. Oh, you want me to go to Kufar? Oh, you going to go to the Kufar on me? It's like, uh, yeah, absolutely. You just beat my mother. You married my mother and you beat on her. What do you mean? Am I going to go to the Kufar on you? Hell yeah, I'm going to the Kufar on you. Me, I.E., am I going to snitch on you? Goddamn right I'm going to snitch on you. You put your hands on my mother. You put your hands on my sister. Or, or would you like me to deal with it another way? <laughs> nah, I'm, I'm not down for your niggotry. I'm not going to meet you where you are. Not on this go round. I'm going to let the, because, you know, that's pretty much the only thing that we respect. <laughs> we respect the authorities. When the police pull up, you know, we sing a different tune. But when it's just us dealing with it, you know, we got to pull out every, every niggotry. You know, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not going to meet you there. I'm not going to meet you there. I don't live by the, I'm not a soldier in the street. I'm not soldiering in the street. I'm a tax paying law abiding citizen. The only way that you can bring me out of my space is when you harm some, you know, you harm one of my children, you harm somebody dear to me. Then and only then I'll go to jail with a smile on my face. I don't care. Other than that, let the authorities deal with you, man. You you want to act like a Negro? You want to act like a nigga? They got places for people that act like that. You go there by yourself. But here we go. You know, oh, you're going to go to the Kufar. You're going to call the Kufar on me. And some people will even label you a non-Muslim for doing that. 
Oh, he's a kafir because he called the kufar. Basically, you snitched. So you bring in your street rules into Islam. You bring in your street rules into Islam. You know, at the expense of depriving yourself of the beauty of Islam. And this is similar to what happens today in our communities. You know, we came out of the prison system. You know, we have this low level thinking and we don't question anything. It's just the, the sheikh said, <laughs> the sheikh said, OK, well, what does that mean? I got to follow it because the sheikh said it. I don't even know the sheikh. You don't know the sheikh. <laughs> you don't even know what the sheikh said. The sheikh said something in Arabic and was translated to you in English. You don't even know what the sheikh said. <laughs> yeah, people talking about, but the sheikh said, what sheikh? <laughs> oh, sheikh Fozan said, or oh, sheikh Fulan said, okay, uh, what did he say? <laughs> he said it in Arabic. Somebody translated it to you who translate, you know, somebody translated to somebody who translated to somebody who translated to you. <laughs> and I'm supposed to base my entire practice of Islam based upon that. I'm supposed to base my entire relationship with God on something off of something that was translated to me in English from some scholar in a whole nother country that was said in Arabic. Just think of the logic in that, man. And if you okay with living your dean like that, fine. All more power to you. But don't superimpose that on me. I, I don't have to follow that. I have to follow what Allah said, what his messenger said. You ain't got to translate that for me. That's already translated. Just direct me to where the verse is. As Allah says in the Quran, Nebbi'uni bi'ilmin. Inform me with knowledge, though. <laughs> Inform me with knowledge. Nabi'uni bi ilmin. Inform me with knowledge. But this is what happens. You know, they don't question anything. Whatever, you know, and, you know, sometimes they get violent. <laughs> Put you out of the masjid because you don't adhere to their medhab or their methodology. You know, this is the low level thinking, you know. Nobody questions anything, right? And they don't aspire to be anything more than what they are. As long as I can wear my thobe above my ankle and I can wear my beard and I can have my prostration mark and my one, two, three, four wives and, you know, and, and I attend this particular masjid and I'm taken from this particular imam who tells me that I'm on the truth. Like, how many people walking around Believing that they are upon the truth because somebody told them they're on the truth, not because you've investigated and you've made a comparison between what you are practicing versus juxtaposed to what is in the Quran and the Sunnah. And you've arrived at your own conclusion that I believe that I am practicing the same, the same, the, the correct way. No, you arrived at the fact that you are on the hop because somebody told you you on the hop. You follow these brothers. You on the hop. You go to this masjid. You on the hop. You on the hop. Masha Allah. So you, your belief about being on the hawk or being on the truth is solely based upon, predicated on somebody telling you that you on the truth. Not you doing your own investigation, not you doing your own, you know, research and mashallah, lots of what I call low level thinking, low level thinking. Right. And along with the low level thinking is, you know, uh, a fixed mindset. Because these individuals, you can't teach them anything. They got it all figured out. You ever come across, you know, a lot of these brothers, like, they, they already got it figured out. Even the sisters. They come on my page. Like, you know what I mean? Like, I'm posting real information. <laughs> real stuff. Ayats, hadith that I've researched. Like, every post that I put up on Instagram or on, on Facebook is researched. This is not stuff that I'm just sitting around at home posting. <laughs> This is stuff that has been researched. And then you have all of these comments and I'm just looking at the comments, just shaking my head like, wow. If it was that simple, I wouldn't need to do any research. I would just post the ayah, post the hadith. I'll give you an example. I posted just the other day, I was covering with my fifth graders about forgiveness. And I put on the board a bar, a, a bar where it was the mistake and people as it relates to mistakes fall into three categories. Is the person who only sees the mistake 
And then there's the person who only sees the good that you do and overlooks the mistake. And then there's the person who addresses the mistake and the and acknowledges the good, at, you know, accordingly. So I have a, a sister, you know, she comes on there and she's like, oh, I disagree with this. And it's just like, OK. First of all, that graph, although I posted it on the board. Uh, that was mentioned by Ibn Al-Qayyim, Rahimullah Ta'ala. Understand something about me. I don't, I don't just post stuff. Even if I post something and I don't put a scholar or attach a scholar's name to it, trust me, I got it from somewhere. I didn't, it just didn't formulate it in my mind. I got it from somewhere. Ibn Al-Qayyim, he said, people, as it relates to mistakes, fall into three categories. The first category is the person who only sees the wrong that you do. He said, this is the worst of the people. All you do is you see the wrong that the person does. He said, on the opposite side of that is the person who only sees the good that you do and overlooks the bad. He said, this is the highest. This is the person that's going to have the most tofiq, most success in his relationship because you've learned the art, you've mastered the art of overlooking. This sister says, well, you don't overlook faults and mistakes. You correct them. <laughs> Here again, you yourself who was making that comment, you wouldn't even want nobody correcting you on all your mistakes. Well, how in the world would you have the audacity to say that we, we, don't, we don't overlook mistakes, we correct those mistakes? <laughs> it's like, Tagawful is part of our deen. <laughs> Doesn't Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala overlook our faults and mistakes, giving us an opportunity to fix them ourselves? Doesn't Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say in the Quran that if he was to hold us accountable for every mistake, for every sin that we've committed, he wouldn't leave anybody on the earth? <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't get the logic. Ask for clarification when you don't understand. But you just jump in there and start commenting, I don't agree, and because blah, 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 and then you give me your whole spiel. Like, here again, a fixed mindset. When you have a fixed mindset, you will never learn anything. Because you got it all figured out. A fixed mindset, meaning you don't necessarily need to learn anything new because all of the previous information that you have, you believe you have it all figured out. That's a very dangerous place to be. A growth mindset is where we want to be. That I've never heard this. This is a new concept. Maybe I can get some more clarification or some more understanding because from where I'm at, I don't really fully understand that or where the person is going with that. Perhaps I can ask for some more clarification. That's a growth mindset. I want to learn more about this. It looks interesting. Don't really fully understand it. Wish you could give me some more explanation for it. That's a growth mindset. It's a person who's willing to you know, receive new information. And this is the danger with brothers who come out of prison. They don't have a growth mindset. They have a fixed mindset. Thus, they will never learn anything more than what they know. This is why brothers, many brothers don't come to lectures. This is why they don't come to conferences. Why they don't go to, you know, uh, counseling, even though they see their marriages crumbling right in front of them, their relationships crumbling right in front of them. They don't go because they have fixed mindsets. I don't need to learn anything new. I got it all figured out. Growth mindset is, I need help with this. I need to figure this out. I need some more information and, you know, let me try to navigate my way through this. So they are much easier, easier to control and to persuade. Their, their loyalty is usually unyielding and incessant, evidenced by, you know, the accusations uh, and everything that was made, you know, later on, the truths that emerged about, you know, Elijah's illegitimate, illegitimate children. Pay attention to this. This will be my last point, right? If you remember when they started talking about Elijah's illegitimate children, Malcolm had kind of put it on blast that he must be crazy if, you know, he's a 70-something-year-old man and he's sleeping with teenage girls. That is what did it for Malcolm with the Nation of Islam. There was no coming back from that. There was no coming back from that. And I'm sure there were many from amongst them that wanted to murder, murder him solely based upon that, even though it was the truth. <laughs> Here again, we rather live with the lie than be discomforted by the truth. Everyone chose to overlook the illegitimate children. 
And this is because our loyalty is always misplaced, always. Our loyalty is always misplaced. We become loyal, right, to the personality rather than the principles, you know, that the personality should embody. We become loyal to the personality rather than loyal to the principles that the personality should embody. Uh, I'm going to stop this and I'm going to go to Periscope uh, because the Periscope stopped. So for those of you who are following here, um, well, no, let me see. This is Periscope. Uh, my phone is, the Facebook page died. So if you know that anybody that was on Facebook and um, they were following along, the face, my phone that was using the Facebook kind of hung up. My phone is dead. Uh, you can have them come to Periscope, inshallah. But they became loyal to the personality of Elijah Muhammad rather than loyal to um, the principles that he should have embodied. And this was why when the Prophet Wasallam died, Abu Bakr was, you know, pressing upon the Sahaba to let Muhammad go. He's dead. Let him go. He said, Man kana ya'budu Muhammadin for in the Muhammad could matter. That whoever worshiped Muhammad, Muhammad is dead. Don't become loyal to the personality. Stick to the principles. He said, Well, man kana ya'budu, ya'budu Allah for in Allah hayyun la yamut. That whoever worships Allah, then Allah is alive and he never dies. Trying to redirect them. The focus should be on the principle, not the personality. And, you know, as they mentioned in the documentary, people needed the nation of Islam. They needed the nation of Islam to believe in. You know, when we unfortunately need something to believe in, we will forsake all truth for that falsehood. We will forsake all truth to have that falsehood. Similar to the story of, you know, the golden calf. So basically, Elijah Muhammad became the golden calf. When you think about the story of Beni Israel, <coughs> right? Musa frees Beni Israel from uh, frees Beni Israel from Fir'aun, and then after freeing them from Fir'aun, they are so psychologically programmed, right? Wanting to believe in Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala tangibly, they needed something physical. They were so used to and accustomed to worshiping Fir'aun. Um, that they had become so programmed and so accustomed to that that they found it very difficult to believe in God with you know you know in the unseen. So in the absence of Musa, when he goes to get revelation from Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, uh, Samidi commands them to melt down their gold and build a calf, and they begin to build the calf. Musa comes back and sees them worshiping the calf, and Musa is infuriated. Elijah Muhammad, in essence, became that golden calf. That they knew this guy, you know, had children illegitimately, and they chose to overlook that. They chose to overlook it because they had to believe, as John Ali said in the uh, documentary, he was divine. And then he goes to use this narration about, you know, Dawood wanting to marry, you know, a young woman, and then you know, sending the soldier off the war to die so he can, you know, number one, from an Islamic standpoint, that narration is fabricated. It's, it's one of the Israeliyat. It's one of the narrations of Bani Israel. However, scholars of Hadith have searched that Hadith and found that there are two narrators in that chain that is weak and should not be taken from. And so therefore, we cannot confirm that that Incident, not to mention that's from a technical side, not to mention from a moral side, no prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would do anything remotely close to that. No prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would do anything remotely close to that. Nonetheless, you know, they they had to believe. They had to believe. So if you go back to the documentary, there was a woman in there by the name of Khadija. And she said that her heart was broken when women came out in the mosque 
saying that Elijah had fathered their children. Pay attention. She said she went home and she told her mother. She said her mother told her, don't worry about it. Elijah Muhammad opened the door of Islam for us. Here again, that narrative. He opened the door of Islam for us. And he cleaned us up and we have to take the good over the bad. And this is the thinking that has led to some of the most dysfunctional behaviors and households in our community uh, in the Black experience. Women will stay in relationships with men who've molested their daughters, beat them, physically abuse them because they will take the good over the bad. They will take the good over the bad. So he sets basically the standard, but doesn't necessarily need to follow the standard himself. As Allah says in the Quran, أَتَأْمُرُونَ النَّاسَ بِالْبِرِّ وَتَنْسَوْنَ أَنفُسَكُمْ وَأَنْتُمْ تَتْلُونَ الْكِتَابِ أَفَلَا تَعْقِلُونَ That do you enjoy good upon the people and then you forget to practice it yourself? أَفَلَا تَعْقِلُونَ Don't you have any intellect? <coughs> As the poet said, تَصِفُ الدَّوَى لَذِي سَقَامِ وَذِي ظَنَى كَيْمَا تَسِحُ بِهِ وَأَنْتَ سَقِيمُ that you're giving medication and you're prescribing medication to everybody else while you're the one that's sick. You are the one that's sick, but you're prescribing medication to everybody else. You know, and here again, the Prophet Sallallahu being, you know, a walking embodiment of, you know, the Quran. Loyalty is to the truth, not to individuals. Ibn Qayyim said about Ibn Taymiyyah, Shaykhuna ahabbu ilayna wal haqqu ahabbu ilayna min. That our Shaykh Ibn Taymiyyah is beloved to us, is dear to us. We love him dearly, but the truth is more beloved to us than he is. The love is for the truth, not to the individual. But when people are coming from lower tiers of society, the lower levels of society, they don't have that. But when you want to believe in something, you want to believe in a false narrative so badly, you'll force yourself to overlook what is right in front of you. You'll force yourself to overlook it because you want to believe. And this is what is called a cognitive bias. It's a cognitive bias. You want to believe in something so bad that you will overlook what is staring you right in your face just so you can believe in it. It's really sad. Just like many Muslims wanted to believe that the Salafis and the Salafi scholars were going to be the orthodox savior of, you know, traditional Islam. We find, <clears throat> excuse me, we finally found our savior, the Salafis, uh, the saved sect, the saved sect. And even though I believe, it is my belief that the Quran and the Sunnah and the methodology of the first three generations of Islam is the correct way to practice Islam. Just because I affiliate or associate myself with that particular doctrine or that particular methodology does not mean that I can engage in any behavior that I want to and I'm saved. This whole idea of the saved sect is very dangerous, man. It's very dangerous. Because it sends the message, it sends a message that as long as I ascribe to or affiliate or associate with this particular methodology of Islam, I can pretty much do whatever the hell I want to do, and I'm saved. I'm a part of the safe sect. And Fairland, you know, in reality, you actually do see that with many Salafis. They'll engage in all types of behavior, and then they'll run down scholar, Sheikh said this and that, and they'll give you the whole soliloquy. They'll give you the whole rundown about how their behaviors are justified or how their behaviors are somehow going to be less sinful than if somebody else who is not affiliated or associated with their, you know, with their methodology, right? I can do this, but, you know, Allah knows my situation, but I'm still on the hop. You did it, but you're a deviant, so you're going here, you're going there. And it's just like, how is that any different than, you know, Catholics who look down on Baptists or, you know, Seventh-day Adventists who look down on this one or look down on that? How is that any different? Every group or every sect or every party, you know, happy and, and rejoicing in what they believe is with them of the truth. 
Elijah Muhammad was not divine. He was not divine. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, God showed us time and time again that he was not divine. But we still had, many people still had to believe that. Even now, the guy on the documentary said, I still walk around with a picture in my wallet of Elijah Muhammad. In my wallet. I still walk around every day. He said, and I will probably do so until the day that I die. I will probably do so until the day I die. If that's not fanaticism, I don't know what is. If that's not fanaticism, I don't know what is. But it's like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said uh, about Quraysh. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَوْ فَتَحْنَا عَلَيْهِمْ بَابًا مِنَ السَّمَاءِ فَظَلُّوا فِيهِ يَعْرُجُونَ لَقَالُوا إِنَّمَا سُكِّرَتْ أَبُصَارُنَا بَلْ نَحْنُ قَوْمٌ مَسْحُورُونَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is people who refuse to accept the truth no matter how clearly it is in front of them. Allah says, وَلَوْ فَتَحْنَا عَلَيْهِمْ بَابًا مِنَ السَّمَاءِ If we were to open for them a door to the heavens, فَظَلُّوا فِيهِ يَعْرُجُونَ And they were to ascend up to that door into the heavens. لَقَالُوا إِنَّمَا سُكِّرَتْ أَبْصَارُنَا They will say that a trick has been played on our eyes. Rather, we are people who have magic has been played on us. They're still not going to accept it. No matter how clear it is standing right in front of them. The Prophet Sallallahu split the moon right in front of them. And what did they say? They said, no, this is only ongoing magic. It just, they could not believe. They could believe. They were not going to, you know. So, this is the same way that, that, you know, Muslims, you know, wanted the Salafis and the scholars they promoted, you know, to be their own, you know, savior. Right. You have Muslims. I know Muslims who migrated to Saudi Arabia because they wanted to be close to the scholars. So you uproot your family, move to Saudi Arabia because you want to be close to the scholars. I kid you not. I kid you not. I know individuals personally who said they wanted to move to Saudi Arabia to be close to the scholars. My wife disassociated herself from a sister who said she wanted to move to the UK to be closer to Abu Khadija so she could learn from him. Mind-blowing. Mind-blowing. I told my wife, if you ever speak to that sister again, me and you are done. You want to move to the UK to be close to Abu Khadija so you can learn from him? Gotta be kidding me. A man who's never sat at the feet of the scholar for any substantial amount of time and learned anything? <laughs> and you're going to uproot yourself and your children and move to the UK to be close to Abu Can't make this stuff up, man. I kid you not. You had Muslims moving to Atlanta and following behind Abu Muhammad. Muslims who uprooted themselves and their families and moved to an entirely different state following the Haq. You had Muslims who moved from New York to New Jersey, you know, when Abu Muslimah was the imam and, you know, turned East Orange, New Jersey into this little Mecca. And I'm not saying that we shouldn't move to areas where there are a large concentration of Muslims. And it seems like a community is thriving. All right. But that's only when you see a community thriving and, you know, you want to be a part of that. But we're not relocating for the personality. That's the point that I'm making. The personality, the individual. I just want to be closer to this person or I want to be closer to that person. The fanaticism. That is what is appalling. That is what is, you know, unacceptable. But here again that need to believe. I'm going to stop here. You know what I mean? Like, I can keep going all night long. And I mean, we've been going for a while now. And I have so much stuff, so many other things to unpack, obviously. You know, six series, you know, six uh, episodes. Uh, no way we could cover all of that in two hours or three hours or however long we've been at it. Uh, <clears throat> I'll start the uh, Periscope and see if you guys have any questions or comments. Inshallah um, ta'ala. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you all. Jazakum Allah khairan for listening. 
hopefully this you know helped to bring some clarity. Hopefully I'm, you know, just echoing, you know, the sentiments of others who've kind of seen it. Hopefully you guys are able to make the connection between what you saw in that documentary, uh, you know, in contrast to what is going on in our communities today. You know, our communities are in such a horrible state, man. Really. You know, you got messages that are turning to pure entertainment in hopes of bringing the youth back into the masjid. The only way that you're going to bring youth back into the masjid is with the hawk, with truth. Entertainment ain't going to do it. Placating their feelings is not going to do it. Bringing, you know, entertainers into the masjid is not going to do it. Truth. That's the only way. And I'm not talking about hardcore, let me rub it in your face type of truth. I'm talking about truth as it was demonstrated by Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The same blueprint, it works. It worked for his community. It worked for many communities that came after him. It's just that we just have a hard time just submitting to the fact that our way of doing things is just not working. It's not working. And so we're kind of dancing around the issue now. We're looking for entertainment. We're looking for the popular speakers. We're looking for this or we're looking for that. You know, just trying to find something new all the while dancing around the main issue. Dancing around the main issue. And I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he return our youth to Islam. Allahumma rudda shababana wa shabab al-muslimin ila deenik. Raddan jameela. Oh Allah, return our youth Return the Muslim youth to Islam with a beautiful return. Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana wa fil akhirati hasana wa qina adab al nar. O Allah, give us the good of this life and the good of the hereafter and to save us from the hellfire. Hada wa sallallahu ala nabiru Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa salama taslima kithira wa akhiru da'wana. And alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.